Hello and welcome to the University of Bedfordshire and the day which happens to be uh, Lesbian Visibility Day. This is our third uh, virtual beds talk um, and the virtual beds talk are intended to attract uh, a, a community following. Um, and I'm aware tonight that we're joined by um, teachers, educators, governors, um, students, parents, carers, extended family members of primary age children, activists and allies, and I'd like to, to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I'm also delighted to be joined by a range of um, informed and passionate speakers. But firstly, I'd like to introduce you to our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education and Sport, Juliet Fern. Um, here at the University of Bedfordshire to uh, welcome and uh, start our event. Hi, Juliet. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Alex. I can't hear anything. You're, you're live at the moment, yeah. Um, hopefully Juliet will be able to join us in a minute. Um, I'll just move on with uh, um, the, the presentation. So our aim tonight is to generate support for RHE um, and to rectify any misconceptions around the subject. Um, it's not our intention to set out a definitive curriculum. Clearly that's for individual schools to tailor the curriculum around their own individual children. And, and the children's families. Um, but what we do hope to do is share ideas, expertise, um, and resources with you this evening. Whilst this curriculum, which embraces LGBT themes for the very first time, um, allows critical work to be done, we don't believe that this should be isolated solely to relationship and health education. It should be supported in other subjects. It should be supported in informal spaces and it can be supported by whole school events which embrace the whole school community. We'd encourage you to um, engage with the evening's themes by um, adding your comments and questions into the chat feed. Uh, my co-host this evening, Dr. Joanne Hill, will be able to direct them to each of the speakers um, at the end of their presentation. I thought I would just start by setting out um, the statutory guidance for relationship and health education in primary schools. Um, there is some flexibility insofar as schools can um, set out at various year groups what they feel is appropriate for their particular pupils, as long as they've taught um, all the areas by the time that pupils have left primary school. So relationships includes family. So children begin to understand that other families may be different than their own, um, but that they're, they're characterized by love and care um, and that they should be respected. Relationships also includes friendships, online friendships, bullying and cyberbullying. Health education includes mental and physical well-being. It also covers facts about drag drugs and alcohol. Um, it looks at first aid, it looks at internet safety, and it also covers the physical and emotional changes that occur at puberty. 
Sex education um, is covered in the National Curriculum for Science, um, and this covers labelling the human body and understanding reproduction in plants and animals. Primary schools have the choice to extend beyond this, um, but that's um, a school's choice, and parents and carers have the choice to withdraw their children from this. Um, relationship and health and education was intended to become mandatory in all primaries from September 2020. Following the closures of schools, uh, that's been delayed until this summer term. Um, and obviously, the ongoing um, effects of school closures and restrictions might mean that certain areas of the curriculum are prioritised and it may re reduce um, the contributions that the wider community can make. Our first speaker this evening, Graham Andre, is a primary school teacher from the Isle of Wight. He's also the star of the BBC programme, No More Boys and Girls. Um, unfortunately, he can't be with us live this evening, um, but he sent in a video which will hopefully get us to start thinking about ways in which we might, all might be guilty of reinforcing gender stereotypes. Good evening. Thank you very much for the Beds Talk crew and gang for inviting me this evening. I'm really sorry I can't be with you. Unfortunately, something's popped up, but uh, I am recording something so you don't miss out anyway. My name's Graham Andre and I'm an assistant head teacher and a class teacher at Lanes End Primary School. I'm currently teaching year five, but uh, I've been through the whole spectrum of year groups. Um, in 2017, I was part of a documentary called No More Boys and Girls Can Our Kids Go Gender Free, which was a fantastic learning experience for myself and for our school. It basically looked at the good work that was going on in Sweden with the schools over there and how they became gender neutral and the impact it had on the children and what they wanted to do, the BBC and online produ outline productions, they wanted to see if they could mimic the same sort of thing within the UK. So they came into our school for only, it's only six weeks. Uh, and in that six weeks, we did a, a series of little interventions and looked at how language and media and the books, etc., within our school and within, you know, life really impact on our children and how they see each other. So basically today we're going to go have a little whistle stop tour. Uh, I'm going to give you some tips and, and ideas. Um, and um, there are men and women equal. Men are better at being in charge. Boys are cleverer because they don't they get into precedent easily, don't they? Can a radical experiment change what kids think? Boys are strong. Yeah. So are girls. girls are I think you're going to struggle. I don't want to do it anymore. I've completely changed my opinion. This could actually be very difficult. No more boys and girls. Wednesday, 16th of August on BBC Two. We were very proud to be part of that documentary and it was nominated for a BAFTA. Unfortunately, it didn't win, but it was nominated. You can find it on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. And if you've got any questions, please email me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Graham Andre or uh, you can email grahamandre07 at gmail.com and if you've got any questions at all after this that you'd like to ask me please do i've got a whole host of resources and things that i can share uh, and i'm really happy to do that well, so gender neutral teaching is not about making boys and girls the same it's about giving boys and girls the same opportunities it's also about not having preconceived expectations of children because of their gender i think it's important that i put that in there um, because when the documentary first came out we got quite a bit of backlash actually school and the, the BBC and the production company uh, but because people just didn't understand what it's about we don't want boys and girls to be the same we just want to give them the same opportunities um, so that they can believe they can be whatever they want to be and can be whatever they want to be later on in life nice picture of me there look a bit younger than I do now <laughs> it's not teaching does we so one of the things that happened uh, during the documentary, and when you watch it, it, it comes quite close to the beginning, was that I used to use terms of endearment a lot in my class. And um, I felt that was part of my relationship with the children. And I was quite happy using those terms of endearment. Um, and so Javid came in, Javid was the presenter and the BBC, and they watched me in a lesson. 
and in uh, in a, over an hour and a half, I used a hundred and forty something terms of endearment, uh, love, mate, sweet pea, fella, and I did use terms of endearment more with the girls than I did with the boys. So I tended to endear myself to the girls more than I did the boys. Uh, and and why I did that, I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe it's because I was, you know, trying to show a bit of a caring side or something. Um, but that was something that had to stop quite soon. So Javid, he said, you know, it's no good us doing all of this work that we're going to do in your class if you're going to continue to use terms of endearment. And every time I used the term of endearment, of course, it told the children that they were different and it highlighted those differences uh, because, of course, the girls were well, love and sweet and sweet pea and quite nice, cuddly terms of endearment where the boys, it was like, mate and fella. So the first thing I had to do was stop it. And as you can see, here was a, a little display that was put up and the children were involved. So what? every time I used a term of endearment, there was a sticker that was stuck on that board. And I did okay, actually. I did by Easter, I think over six weeks. Just think I used 140 terms of endearment in one lesson. Uh, over six weeks, I think there was about nine or ten stickers. And now I don't use terms of endearment at all. We were having a bit of a talk about this on Twitter the other day. And someone said, you know, if we use the same term of endearment with boys and girls, is that OK? And I'm thinking, actually, mm, I don't know. I don't know. It's a bit of a debate on that one. Um, possibly it's OK, but we should see. I don't know. If you can stop using them all together, then that's great. I mean, it gets my brain working with names, and sometimes I do forget names, especially the older I get. But, um, you know, anything, actually, anything, little thing like this that we can do to stop um, showing good boys and girls that they're different, then it's good. When you're in class, uh, when you're referring to professions, try to keep them gender neutral. So, you know, if it's if you're talking about a fire firefighter, don't say fireman or firewoman. It's a firefighter, postman, postwoman. You know, it's, it's you, you try to make sure that when you are talking about professions, that you keep it gender neutral. But also try and make sure that when you are doing your curriculum, that you manage to have good examples of inspirational men and women within your curriculum, especially when it comes to things like science and IT, history, geography, etc. because quite often we revert back to the uh, dead white males. And actually we need to inspire our children through all sorts of people from all spectrums and all types. Also need to be really careful. And this is something that really came through on the documentary, the language we use around our boys and the un unrealistic expectations that, you know, boys aren't meant to cry and we ask them to man up and it's it's not really doing our boys any good at all. So try and be careful with the language we use in the classroom. I can't imagine any of you would do that. But unfortunately, there are cases where it does happen. And of course, when this does happen, and we've seen it in our classrooms, the boys struggle to talk about their feelings. Um, we did a little uh, diagnostic and we asked the children, we gave them different feelings words. And mm -hmm. the boys, the only feeling that they could think mm -hmm. of extra vocabulary for was angry. angry. Mm -hmm. um, when it came to being happy or, or sad or love, they couldn't think of hardly any at all. Um, the girls could. The girls could think of lots of different types of vocab around those feelings, but boys couldn't. So we need to give those boys the skills to talk about their feelings. And I think the more we do that, the better. Um, using books is very good. Circle times is excellent. Uh, of course, through through role models and things and expectations. Um, but if you look at this statistic here, we really need to try and do something like something about this. And if we can, if we can. Sorry, I'm going to move that so you can see that. Uh, a little tweet there from Matt. Um, if we can do something about this, it would be brilliant. We just want our boys to be able to talk about their feelings uh, so that this doesn't happen. It's also some, re these are by Elise Gravel and she's fantastic. She has some really nice stuff on her website. And this shows you, uh, you know, not the typical stereo t stereotypes of boys and girls. It shows you sort of the opposite. So, you know, boys can be quiet, 
and caring, etc. Whereas the girls can be <laughs> cranky and gross. <laughs> so again, I know we've got that expectation when I was saying about the boys, but also with the girls too. Don't always expect girls to be cutesy and nice and everything else. They may want to climb trees and be adventurers. Why not? I do too. Um, that's it for me, really. I, if you want some more information, um, and like I say, this is just a very, very quick whistle stop tour. Uh, if you do want some more information, uh, I am part of the Global Equality Collective. Pop on over to their website. They've got a fantastic app for schools where basically you go through um, ask, answering questions, your staff do, and then it gives you the results and then the resources for you to cover what you need to do within your school. It's, it really is brilliant. Please, please, please take a look at their website. They've got lots of resources over there as well uh, to share. Some of them I've created or helped to create too. So please have a look at that. There's also the book that I was co-author of. Uh, yeah, co-author, eh? <laughs> The Equal Classroom, which was Lucy Rycroft Smith, who's fantastic, with little bits at the end of each uh, chapter by me. Um, I'm quite proud of that. You can get that on most good bookstores. Um, if you want it signed, please just ask. I can always get you a signed copy. And if you do, like I said at the start, if you do want to ask any questions, that was really quick. I've got so much information. I've got so many things that I'd like to talk about. I mean, we didn't just look at language used in a classroom. We looked at the books that we used. Um, we looked at our whole curriculum. The journey our school have been, has been through has been, has been quite phenomenal. Those children now are now year seven, the ones that have, uh, have, 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 were part of the documentary. Um, but again, like I say, if you would like some more information, please just ask. You can find, if you Google Graham Andre, um, No More Boys and Girls, you will find that I've done several uh, conferences uh, keynote speeches where you'll see some more information. Um, but again, please, please, please contact me at Graham Andre on Twitter or Graham Andre 07 at gmail.com. Thank you again for being part, for asking me to be part of this. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Again, sorry I couldn't be there live, but I hope this has helped a little bit. Um, it's just to be careful with the language you use in the classroom because it can be so powerful. When I trained to be a teacher, I wasn't told about the language I used and the way it would impact on our children, because of course there are so many other things that we need to learn as student teachers. But I do think this is really important for our boys and girls. So thank you again. Take care. See you all soon. Oh, so that was uh, Graham Andre just speaking, and I'll, I'll add uh, Joanne, uh, Dr. Joanne Hill. Uh, to come and sp uh, speak as well. So obviously we haven't got Graham Andre um, to answer any questions, but um, he was very gracious and, and gave his contact details there. He's on at uh, Graham Andre on Twitter, um, and he's quite um, um, quite a presence on Twitter, uh, and he's uh, very receptive. So I'm sure he'll he'll pass on any um, responses. But um, just speaking to Joanne, I, I felt that it was um, a really important speaker to start with because I think if we're asking young people to think about relationships, we've got to start with ourselves, haven't we? We've got to understand ourselves a little bit more. Um, and um, and I think um, a lot of the fear around perhaps talking about transgender themes is that as soon as we talk about transgender, um, perhaps this, this fear that children are going to assume that they're a different gender um, and actually perhaps we need to challenge those gender norms to start with so actually they don't assume that they're a different gender they just recognize that actually they can be whoever they want to be yes and i think one of the important things that on uh, that graham talked about there was um what do we mean when we talk about gender neutrality and the difference between trying to make everybody the same and for some people the idea of gender neutrality might um, conjure up this notion of everything needs to be beige when in fact it means there's a whole rainbow of colours so we're not just talking about pink and blue we're talking about um, encouraging all children to uh, be um, 
to think of uh, all the options that are open to them. And in terms of, uh, yeah, as you were saying about trans uh, inclusion and trans visibility, then for those young children, we need to be thinking about what those differences may be between gender expression and gender identity and um, you, you sort of your internal feeling about yourself and how those things get expressed. Maybe if we think more about a range of gender expressions and the rainbow of colours that's available and not just pink and blue, um, then it's it's more inclusive in general for everybody so thank you joanne and i'm sure um some of the other speakers tonight will will build on some of the themes that graham has introduced there um so our next speaker this evening um is charlotte feather um we're delighted to have her join us uh she's from the university of sunderland uh she's also the lgbtq um officer uh for the university of sunderland student uh, group um, and she's also the creator of the LGBT Primary Hub. So thank you for joining us Charlotte and I know you have some key messages for us. Thank you, yeah I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Let's see, hopefully this works. Are you able to see my screen there? Yes, just come on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Charlotte Feather. I qualified as a primary teacher last year and I'm now doing my master's in education at the University of Sunderland. And as Alex said, I created the LGBTQ plus primary hub and I'm going to speak about, a bit more about that anyway. So when Alex asked me to present some key messages, I kind of felt a bit overwhelmed because I thought, wow I can take this in any direction I have so many key messages that I would love to tell you about but I thought about it a bit deeper and I thought what is the key message the one key thing when we're talking about inclusive education and for me I would say that that's a willingness a willingness to question a willingness to learn and a willingness to care so I thought I'd start with this quote and it says you are personally responsible for becoming more ethical than the society you grew up in and that's by Eliezer Yudowski. Now that resonates with me for a number of different reasons. And I believe that that's what we should all be striving for. We should be wanting to create more ethical societies than the one that we were raised in. But it does require a level of willingness and effort. So my first question for anyone who is an educator is, why did you choose a career in education? Was that to make a difference, to shape the minds of future generations because you simply enjoy working with kids? Probably all of the above. Now, we know that our role as teachers goes far beyond teaching national curriculum subjects. And with that, we have the ability to impact so many children's lives. And with that power, hopefully, what we want to do is create positive change. And in terms of inclusive education, that's about creating environments where all children feel accepted valued and celebrated. Now the response to that is okay but I'm only one person what can I do and I would say correct we are as individuals if we look at it from a physics perspective you know we are physically insignificant we live on this tiny planet that orbits one star amongst 200 billion other stars in our Milky Way galaxy which is one amongst two trillion other galaxies that we know of so yeah we are pretty insignificant but that doesn't mean that we don't have the power to make some significant impacts in society. Now, something that Thomas Sudendorf said is that one of the key characteristics that makes us human appears to be that we have the, uh, that we have the ability to think about alternative futures and make de deliberate choices accordingly. So what he means by that is that we have the ability to think about the future and then do things now that are gonna impact that. And this is where I go on to speak about the ripple effect. So most of you have probably heard about the ripple effect. If not, it's essentially a theory that says that every single choice that we make ultimately shapes the course of our lives and the course of the lives of others. And an example of that that most of you are probably aware of is the random act of kindness. So doing one small thing during your day that's random, that's kind, you know, that has an impact on someone's day. They then go and maybe they treat someone else nice and that goes on and it creates a larger change, a nice ripple effect of positivity. So what can I do to cause a ripple effect? These are my 
five top tips for creating LGBTQ plus inclusive environments. The first one, and I would say the most important one, is to reflect on your current practice. Question what you're currently doing. Do you use inclusive language? Do you avoid making assumptions? Do you challenge heteronormative and cisnormative practices? Are you being an ally? Now, when we're talking about being reflective, we also need to consider reflexivity. So questioning what it is that we do or what it is that we don't do, but then also unpicking that and thinking, okay, why do I do that? Why are these the assumptions that I'm taking? What are these prejudices that I have in my life? And how is that impacting what I do as a teacher? So that would be the first thing that I say everyone should be doing is reflecting on their current practice. And it should be something that's continuous as well. Once you have reflected, this is when you then educate yourself. So in order to create inclusive environments, we must first understand what they are and why they're important. I kind of think of it as, you know, we wouldn't go into a maths lesson not knowing the mathematical concept that we're about to teach. So how can we expect teachers to teach LGBTQ plus inclusivity if they don't see the importance of that and they don't understand, if they don't have the knowledge to educate in that way? And I think one of the things for research that we've seen is that it can be overwhelming because for some people, this is territory that they've never had to consider. Um, and I would say it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something that's a continuous journey and just being open and again, being willing to change is the most important thing. So as it was mentioned, I created the LGBTQ plus primary hub and that was for this exact reason. It was to help teachers, it was to support them and enhance LGBTQ plus inclusivity in all primary schools. So on the website, there are different sections. There's things here about heteronormativity and cisnormativity, gender stereotyping. There are uh, book lists that I've put together. So there's um, a book list for picture books for lower down in the school, although I think picture books should be used across primary. Um, and also a, book, uh, a chapter book list as well. And there's also a section for LGBTQ plus teachers for support. Now, hopefully this is going to grow and expand. Um, as I said, I'm doing my master's at the same time at the moment. So when I get a bit more time to work on it, that's something I definitely want to develop. So my third tip is being an active ally. And for me, the difference between being an ally and being an active ally is you can be an ally and say that you support LGBTQ plus people, which is great. You know, we need allies. But we need to go beyond that. We need to make sure that we're being role models, making sure that all children and staff members feel important and feel valued and taking those proactive steps to utilise inclusion. One of the things I would say with being an active ally is make sure you're supporting your inclusion or RSE leader or your PSHE leader and always, you know, don't be a bystander. My fourth tip is about uh, inclusive resources and texts. Children need to see themselves represented in their learning resources. We know that we learn better when we can make those connections between abstract concepts and our own lived experience. And we know that books in particular act as windows, mirrors and sliding glass doors to the world. So windows, they're getting to see some form of reality, whether that's in you know, a different kind of reality, a fantasy world, they're seeing a reflection of reality whether that's mirrors, where they're seeing themselves represented in what they're reading, and then sliding glass doors to see a world that they don't know about. So that's why it's really important that all schools have diverse books in them, because as much as you may think, well, we don't have any children from same-sex families, or we don't have any kids who are LGBTQ+, I for one would say you probably do anyway, but even if you don't think you do, we need all children to see that there are diverse genders and sexualities. Um, my final tip is to always challenge discrimination. So we talk about non-negotiables in schools, mainly to do with maths and literacy. And I think challenging discrimination is a complete non-negotiable. We as teachers are required to do all that's reasonable to protect the health, safety and welfare of pupils. And we don't get to decide who is protected and who isn't. As a bare minimum, and I know this isn't what we would want, but as a bare minimum, it's a legal obligation to protect the children in our care. But what about our moral and civic duties? There's more that we should be doing as teachers to ensure that all these children are represented and are in a safe environment. 
So I just want to end with this quote by Barbara Gittings, who said, equality means more than passing laws. The struggle is really won in the hearts and minds of the community. And to me, that's within education. So that is the end of mine. Hopefully I can stop sharing. Sorry if I went through that really fast. <laughs> No, that was absolutely brilliant, Charlotte. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand over to Joanne. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I'm going to open it out saying if there's any questions that anyone want to um, post up, please do put them in. And uh, while we are waiting for any questions to come through, I will ask Charlotte. Uh, you mentioned about picture books, which is... Um, something that I read a lot of at the moment because I've got two young children if you could pick out um one picture book that you know which which you think that parents should read to their children uh, that helps with some of the themes that we're looking at today can you think of one that you would recommend oh that's a really hard question <laughs> there's so many great books out there um one that jumps to mind straight away is a book called Mixed and it's about different crayons and I think that kind of opens up a conversation in a really easy way because it's not necessarily talking about sexuality or gender it's just talking about difference and I think that's a really great place to start you know we're not trying to some people may think that we're trying to push this gay agenda on children which is not what we're doing we're just trying to break down this heteronormativity and cisnormativity that we have in schools and yeah I, I love the story mixed I think it it can just open up so many different conversations about so many different things to do with diversity but that was a horrible question because there's so many great books. <laughs> there are, definitely. Um, one that I really enjoy reading is Antango Makes Three, mm -hmm. which is about the, and I, I spotted it on your um, presentation slide. So uh, just for the rest of the audience, um, Antango Makes Three is about uh, two boy penguins, as they're called in the book, uh, at New York City Zoo. And uh, they pair up. And they find a stone and they sit on the stone to try to um, incubate it, like when all the rest of the couples have got their eggs. And they're puzzled that the egg doesn't hatch. So um, there is an abandoned egg which is given to this um, this couple to, to incubate and they sit on it and it hatches and uh, they call it tango. Well, the, as the, the zoo keepers call it tango because it takes two to tango. And um, yeah, it's a nice little story about families and um, looking after children and bringing a child into the world. So uh, we, I'm going to bring Alex back in. If there are any questions for Charlotte during, um, if you think of them a bit later on, then please do feel free to use the chat function on YouTube. Oh, we have a question through. Uh, have we got time for this question, Alex? Yeah, I think we've, yeah. Got, we've got a minute. Yeah, we're, we're okay. Thank you. Great, we've got a question from Roxana which is um, in lessons surrounding personal, social and emotional development, they already cover diversity, equality, tolerance and respect. So why do we specifically cover also LGBT? No, that's a great question. I think, you know, we have been doing great work uh, for years on looking at diversity. I think for me, the reason why we need to be specific about LGBTQ plus issues is because for too long we've kind of brushed over it. And, you know, we say to kids, yeah, it's OK, you can be who you want or you can do this. But we never we're never actually specific enough about what we're talking about. And I think if we can talk to children about heterosexual relationships, which no one bats an eyelid at because it's just, you know, the norm we would say to a, a three or four year old, you know, about a mummy and daddy living together. Why can we not say about two mummies living together? That's kind of uh, that's why I think about that. I think we should be more specific. I think for too long we haven't addressed it. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, completely agree. And uh, yeah, it's about making all our children in school and their families feel welcome in the school community. And that's how they're, they're going to thrive. And uh, we're, we're sort of forgetting about a small uh, percentage, but a very important percentage of our school community if we don't mention these themes. So as um, we said, um, if you do have any other questions, I'm sure Joanne will be able to direct Charlotte um, to them um, in the chat feed. Uh, but now um, I can introduce our third speaker. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Andrew Moffat, MBE. Um, he's um, a prize 
a Global Tr Teacher Prize nominee. Um, he was also um, very much uh, a part of the No Outsiders program, which I've uh, enjoyed uh, reading a lot about. Um, he's uh, read, he's written a number of journal articles about it and books. Uh, and one of the themes that came out of it, and that's what I was asking Andrew to talk about this evening, was he suggested that we perhaps look for respect rather than celebration. And I just wondered if he could elaborate on that idea. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you, Alex. And uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. So uh, I've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk quickly. Uh, I'm going to first of all talk about uh, when I got this wrong. I did get it wrong in the past. Here's a headline from, uh, I think it's The Independent. It says, gay teacher resigns at a parent protest. This is 2014. Uh, this happened because I used to have a resource that was just single issue, just LGBT. It was called Chips, Challenging Homophobia in Primary Schools. And I made no attempt for you to, uh, to widen it out into any other kind of uh, diversity. And I also made no attempt to uh, engage with parents at that time. I, I sort of felt at a time that, well, why should I? You know, the law is on my side. Uh, you know, we don't talk to parents about how we teach about science. We don't talk to them about how to teach about geography. So why have a meeting about this? But it's very naive to think that because, you know, it doesn't acknowledge that not everyone's on the same page and we have to bring parents with us. Um, so uh, when this happened, it's not actually uh, quite true. I didn't resign. I just moved schools, but it was quite difficult. As an as a indent here, it says some Christian and some Muslim parents have told me they do not want their children learning it's okay to be gay and that did happen in that school so where did I go to next after that I thought I need to go to a place where I can really learn from a community and change my work and make it successful make it better so I went to a school that was 99% Muslim I did that deliberately because I wanted to learn from this Muslim community and really find a way to make this work to talk to the parents so I went to Powerful Community School in, in, in Allen Rock in Birmingham, 99% Muslim. And there I uh, wrote No Outsiders. And the whole point of No Outsiders, the way it was different from my last resource, was it was not just about LGBT. You know, thinking about it, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, in primary schools, you don't have, you know, on Monday, the gender lesson, on t Tuesday, disability lesson, on Wednesday, the race lesson, on Thursday, it's the gay day. You know, you don't do that, do you? You have lessons about equality, don't you? Equality lessons where you can talk about ways that we're different and bring it all in together. So it's all taught in context. So you don't put one equality on a power put above anyone else. It's all taught in context. Not one is more important, but also not one is less important. And what you can't do is pick and choose equalities and differences that you're comfortable with and leave out ones that you're not. So you would never say, well, we won't talk about disability because it will confuse children or it might upset children. You know, we would never say that, you know, but at the same time, you also can't say we're not going to talk about LGBT because LGBT people exist in the community and we're part of the Equality Act 2010. It's the right thing to do. You know, we, we need to talk about all members of our community. So went to uh, this new school, had lots of meetings of parents, 11 meetings actually, over a space of, of six months and wrote No Outsiders. And the whole point of No Outsiders, I love that term actually. In fact, it was a term that did originate from a study at the University of Sunderland uh, 10 years before. I was part of it, 2006. So when I first came out in a primary school. So what's that? Goodness me, 15 years ago. Um, I've come out in every school since. I'm in my fourth school now in fact the last time i came out to a class was four weeks ago to my current class i've had them, I've had them since christmas year four um and the whole point of no outsiders really was uh, was that um it's a great term to use because every child understands what it means to be an outsider and no one wants to be left out so if you're teaching children when they first come into school you know age four no one's left out here you know there's no outsiders here it's very very powerful and if you ask any child in my school what no outsiders means, a reception child will say something like, we all play together, uh, you know, no one's left out. By year six, hopefully, they would say something like, well, in our school, you can have different skin, black skin, brown skin, white skin, have disabilities, be from a different family, be a gay, lesbian or trans, uh, be from a different country, a different language, have a different religion, but no one's left out. But it all starts with no, uh, so it all starts with no one's left out, we all play together.
No, our side has worked brilliantly uh, at my school. In fact, I've got another headline here uh, from Parkfield School from two years later. It says, everyone knows we respect Islam in our school and we respect gay people. That's from the Independent in February 2016. And that was after a year of doing No Outsiders where we talked with parents and we had really, really good meetings. And one of the things that came up there was parents would say to me, oh, are you going to teach our children it's okay to be gay? And that's a sticking point. That was a sticking point. How do we manage that? Because I can't just, you know, disrespect, you know, religion and faith and belief and, and say, you know, well, it's the law tough. You know, I can't say that. I've got to find a way of bringing the community with me. So what we said in the end, and a parent came up with this idea. I remember her saying in a meeting, she said, she said, OK, it's important that children know two sides so that uh, the parents can, can talk about home and they can put both ideas in the head and accept both views. I remember thinking, that's fantastic. That's exactly how we do this work. We children understand that there are two ideas that we can balance these two ideas. Um, you know, and it's not about being right or being wrong. It's about coexisting. You know, we can coexist. We can disagree. We can have respect for each other. And the example of how this works in, in practice was um, I came out in Parkfield School in 2015, uh, 2016, sorry, uh, to no backlash at all. And I remember driving uh, some boys in a minibus to, to a football match. And a year six boy saying to me, Mr. Moffat, can I ask you a question? He said, why do you choose to be gay? I said, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll answer it by asking you a question. Why do you choose to have brown skin? He said, I didn't choose to have brown skin. And I said, I know, I didn't choose to be gay. It's just the way I am. He said, can I ask you another question? He said, in mosque, they say you can't be gay, but you say you can be gay. So which one is it? And I said, you're right, you're absolutely right. And the best thing about being in the UK is we can talk about these things. There are different beliefs and, 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 and different ideas. And we can discuss them and debate them. And we might disagree sometimes, but that's OK. We can still have respect for each other. We can still get along. And I still today actually can't think of a, a better way to answer that. Because what else am I going to say? I'm not going to say, well, mosque is wrong. Mosque isn't wrong, but I'm also not wrong. So what do we do? We coexist. Um, the whole point of know outsiders is, is, is it's, uh, it teaches children we're all different, but isn't that wonderful? And it uses picture books. Now, it's great to see Charlotte, the last speaker, pick out picture books, you know, absolutely. I've always used picture books, you know, um, I've been teaching for 25 years, you know, and uh, I love picture books. They're perfect for doing this work because we talk about the character, not about, you know, us, not about us. What would the character say? I'm very conscious, I've got six minutes left, so I'm gonna very, very quickly show you just like two or three books. This one, using reception, Blue Chameleon, and it's wonderful. It's about a chameleon who is lonely and he wants to make a friend. He thinks you have to look like someone to be their friend. To keep changing colour uh, and changing shape as well. Um, it never works. In the end, he realises actually you can just be yourself. You haven't got to change colour. You know, you can be yourself to make friends. What a wonderful message for the reception child. Charlotte last picture mentioned mix. I actually happened to have it in the pile of books next to me. It's perfect. It's wonderful because it talks about uh, it's got blues and reds and yellows and they all live harmoniously. And then one day the reds say that uh, reds are best. Now the problem is, how do you respond to that? The yellows say, no, we're the best. The blues are too cool to respond, so they don't respond at all. Therefore, the city is split up into different walls and different spaces. Um, they end up working it out and, and, and then they, and they get on. But it's great to talk about race and about discrimination. Um, we did our protest at my school two years ago, and they were horrific, absolutely awful. Um, I may never get over, you know, hearing, 400 people outside my school chanting, get Mr. Moffat out, get Mr. Moffat out. Absolutely dreadful, you know, but we got over the protests. Um, again, engage your parents, you know, went back to what it's all about. Today, Parkville School is doing no outsiders. You know, people wear these lanyards, you know, like I wear them, not outsiders now a charity, um, you know, and, uh, I, I, and it's in hundreds of schools across the country. In a way, the protest actually made no outsiders huge. I don't think it's worth it for my mental health, but actually, you know, you have to look at the positive. The positive was it made No Outsiders famous. You know, I'm in more schools now than I could ever have imagined. One of the things that I learned from the protest, though, and Alex mentioned it, was the use of the word celebrate. Now, there was a perception amongst the protesters that we were forcing Muslim children to celebrate LGBT. Now, I don't think we were. There was never any gay pride marches, no rainbow flags around the school. 
you know, but that was the perception. So what do you do with that? And I was struggling with this while the protests were on. How can we come out of this? You know, well, where can we go? And I had a letter from a vicar during the protests uh, who was a governor of a school. And his school did know outsiders. He was a very supportive letter. But he did say, he said, I wonder if you could stop using the word celebrate, he said. He said, would you use the word tolerate instead? He said, because as a vicar, I find it hard to celebrate LGBT people. Now, at the time, I remember thinking, being quite sort of put out, actually, about that. But you're asking me to use the word tolerate. Tolerate is a, a dreadful word, really. It's like you're putting up with somebody. I'm not going to use the word tolerate. But then I was thinking, what well, do I have to use the word celebrate? You know, because if you're talking about celebrating diversity, so, you know, then, then, and you're talking about how that includes LGBT people, because it, because it does, well, maybe you are asking people to celebrate LGBT, and maybe some people aren't, aren't comfortable with that. So what word can we use instead to still bring everyone with us? And I wonder about using the word embrace instead. We accept. Um, we just are. We just are different. You know, look, I love being gay. I'm very happy being gay. And I'll celebrate being gay every day. But I don't need you to celebrate it. You don't have to celebrate being gay with me. And there are things about you that are different that I can accept without judgment. And I'm, I'm happy for you, but I don't have to celebrate it with you. So, look, you know, I, mean, I may change my mind in years to come. Who knows? You know, but this is where I am at the moment. And I think it's about, you know, finding ways to bring more, more people with us. So if dropping celebrate brings people on, do you know what? I'm happy to drop celebrate. Have I got time to do one to say one more book? Oh, I no one's saying no, so I'm going to do it. Right. This book isn't in the No Outsider scheme, but new books come all the time, you know, and on my website, no-outsiders.com, you find loads of lesson plans for new books. This book, I just love, My Shadow is Pink. It came out uh, last year. It's not in the No Outsiders scheme, but it's, it's a lesson on my website. And I want to show, I want to read you a bit of work from a child from my school. The whole point of this book is that a boy has got a pink shadow. He's embarrassed about it because he wants a blue shadow like all your, everyone else. His dad says to him, look, it's just a phase, you know, um, um, you'll get over it. But he never does. Anyway, school has a dress up day and uh, he wants to wear a dress. You can see dad really worried here. But the boy runs into school in his pink sparkly dress and the kids turn around and the room goes silent. The boy runs out of school, runs past his dad, being angry and sad. I rip off my dress, throw it down the floor. I won't wear it again. Not ever. No more. So we wrote to the boy from the teacher. Uh, a letter from the teacher, and here's what, what, what one of the children wrote. Hello, it's amazing to see you and your pink shadow is, is incredible. I loved it. Don't feel down about how your shadow looks. Being different is good. It makes you unique and special. Just imagine a world where everyone, if everyone was the same. It'd be so boring. We'd look the same, talk the same, do everything the same. It'd be awful. The world would feel dull. When you walked in, everyone looked at you. But they might have thought how amazing you and your wonderful shadow are. So please don't feel lonely or left out because we'd love you to have you come back into class. It would make my day. The thing is, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It matters on the inside because personality is what makes matters the most. So don't feel ashamed, feel proud of who you are. Best regards, the teacher. Incidentally, I'll show you how the book ends. I'll just throw it on the floor. The book ends in a lovely way. The boy comes home, dad knocks on the door. And again, we stop there and we say, what's dad gonna say to him? Dad comes in and he's wearing a pink sparkly dress. And dad walks the, uh, his boy to school. He talks about how we all have different shadows, actually some. And uh, he says, uh, get back to school. If someone won't like you, then they are the fool. Some they will love you and some they will not. But those who do love you, they'll love you a lot. What a lovely, lovely story about being different, being unique and everyone being welcome. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. I, I, I'm trying to keep in time. I think that's about uh, time. So I will leave it there. But I'll hang on for questions at the end of the uh, uh, end of the, um, uh, the, uh, the session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Andre. That was fantastic. So I'd like to uh, say if anybody would like to um, post a question up in the chat, feel free. We haven't got any at the moment. So uh, if anyone would like to add something, you are welcome to, and we will ask it to Andre. Um, Alex, seeing as I asked the question to Charlotte on the previous one, do you want to come in with any questions to Andrew? While we, while we wait for any questions to come through on the chat. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, your learning experiences, obviously, you know, tackling new things and, and contentious things. I wondered if you had any other ideas for educators that are trying to explore some of these themes and, and are coming up against resistance with, you know, head teachers or governors or parents. What what would you suggest? I think it's about uh, not giving up. So you have to take a step back, a step forward. You know, um, it's, it's not always a straight line uh, going forward. When we had our protest, we stopped now outsiders for five months. It's very hard to do that. We've got criticism amongst some people to say that we shouldn't give up. You know, but you know what? It's about, you know, look, look at the big picture, you know, and, and about, look, you know, we're doing outsiders again now. You know, you've got to step back some. Sometimes people aren't ready, you know, so don't give up. Find another way to do it. Find allies, you know, keep going. You know, I do feel in the end, you know how this is going to end? It's going to end, you know, in 10, 20 years with all schools doing this work. We have to get over this bumpy bit now, but we will get over it. Yeah, absolutely. And not undermining um, your experiences at all, Andrew. And I think um, a lot of us here can can share some of those experiences. But but actually, a lot of the research shows that we overestimate the resistance from parents. And a lot more parents are actually supportive um, of this theme. And actually, um, it's it's our reticent, perhaps, that that's stopping us moving forwards and exploring these themes a little bit more. I agree. I work for, for Matt and, uh, and there are four schools in the Matt and I've led the RSC consultation in, in all the schools in the Matt and, uh, and in all the other schools, parents came expecting to argue and to support the school. You know, so parents came, turned up and, 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 and wanted to, wanting to have an argument to support what we were doing, you know, and actually there were, there were no arguments because I do think that most people well, most people are for equality, aren't they? Most people, actually, in the, in the world today, you know, the UK today, you know, no one wants bullying, you know, people want their children to be included and to feel, you know, they belong. You know, what we need to, what the, 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 the challenge is to, is to, is to um, move the, the, uh, the, the question away from people of a different agenda out there to stop RSE, stop social education, you know, uh, and to hijack it, basically. We need to press it into the schools, you know, not to people outside the schools. Yeah. And, and I suppose it's appealing to parents out there listening tonight to realise, actually, if you're um, an advocate of this, to, to voice your opinion as well, because I think you don't hear enough of the positive voices and we, we take the very few um, that are negative and, and, and we run with that. And, and perhaps it's, it's asking for those that are supportive to, to voice their opinions a little bit absolutely. more. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Alex. And in fact, I spoke to a head teacher only two weeks ago who had put off doing her obviously consultation she was using no outsiders and she's very nervous about it and so she uh, texted me the night of her consultation of her meeting and she said it was absolutely brilliant she said parents one parent was crying and saying why didn't we do this a year ago you know and it's because uh, and i did this deliberately with no outsiders i use picture books that that are inviting and are non-threatening and that parents can can use and they're all on youtube and you can just look and you can enjoy them together you know it makes it non-threatening you know, so if you are a parent listening, you know, you could do a power of good by going into school and saying, you know, you want this kind of work because schools need to hear that, especially schools that are nervous. Well, thank you again, Andrew, for such an informative and energetic presentation. Um, you covered an awful lot and we're very appreciative for your time. So uh, thank you. So moving on now, uh, we've now got um, two current primary school teachers who are going to uh, present how they would deliver RHE um, in primary. So we've got Amanda Jamil, who's a year six and um, a foundation lead uh, in a primary school in North London. And she's joined by Kerry Lewisu, who's a year four teacher and the RSC lead. So thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. Brilliant. Hi, thanks for having us. I'm Amanda. I'm Kerry. And we are here to give you a snapshot of what RSE looks like in our primary school setting. Um, so we're just going to swap to our PowerPoint. Uh, 
Okay, we're going to start off with our icebreaker activity that we use in year six as an introduction to our RSC topic. Um, this is a great way of getting all the giggles out of the way and any questions or addressing any misconceptions later on or further on in the topic. So we start off by asking the children or having sort of big bits of paper all around the classes and asking them to write down as many different words or names that they know for these very um, various body parts, any slang words. And it's quite interesting each year. Um, so I've been teaching for 11 years now. It's always really interesting. Each year that I teach this, I learn a new word for penis or vagina or breasts. And you'll be surprised at how many words the children know. But it's always a great way in. We get all of the giggles out and we're then ready to move on. So this is the structure of our presentation. We're going to start with our school's rationale. Then we're going to look at three dimensions, which is the scheme that we're currently using in our school. And then we're going to show you some lessons and how they progress throughout the years. Okay, so our rationale. So at the Bowen, sex education provides an understanding that positive caring environments are essential for the development of a good self-image and that individuals are in charge of and responsible for their own bodies. It's lifelong learning about physical, moral and emotional development. Our Relationships and Sex programme provides information which is relevant and appropriate to the age and maturity of the children, taking into account social and religious concerns. Children are taught how their bodies work, are prepared for puberty, sexual relationships they may have in the future. It's an understanding of the importance of stable and loving relationships, respect, love and care. And essentially what our job is in the primary setting is to prepare the children, making sure that they're secondary ready when they leave um, primary school age and to also make sure that they understand that it's all um, to do with loving relationships and respect. And then we move on to equal opportunities, which is part of our RSC policy. Um, to summarise this, we want our children to be fully aware of all the difficult, uh, different communities that we have in the area. So that would be our religious communities, the local communities, our school community, and of course the LGBT community. It's our job to teach the children here at De Bowen to be inclusive and to treat everyone equally and respectfully making sure that they are fully aware of all different people, different choices, and then that, and that's okay. So we know that the LGBT community can face some hardships and stereotypes, and it's our job to make sure that the children recognize this and limit these through our teaching. So this is a quote that we'd like to share with you um, that just shows the impact that we in the primary setting have on children um, that is then taken on with them through their adult lives. So evidence suggests young people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans are more likely to experience bullying. And this type of bullying has significant effects on educational entertainment, absence levels and emotional well-being, which I think just um, really encompasses everything that we do here in the primary setting. Um, and why we do it. Okay, we're going to talk to you a bit about um, a scheme of work that we um, use at our primary school, and it's called Three Dimensions. Um, we've been using Three Dimensions for the past four years, and we chose this scheme as we thought it best fit with our school setting and the community that we have and sort of all stakeholders involved in our school, including our parents um, and any um, backgrounds that they may have. Um, it's recently been updated to include all of the statutory or the new statutory requirements of 2020. Um, so we have updated any of our resources that we use um, and adults have also had access to any of these updates and the reading that goes along with them. So here's a small snapshot of what um, the PSHE in lower key stage two programme looks like. So pupils are taught about the diverse makeup of family units and that these are representative of our society today, focusing on the importance of stability and support. Support. The objectives are to know that stable, caring relationships, which may be different types, are at the heart of happy families and are important for children's security as they grow up and to know and understand how the makeup of family units can differ. So at lower key stage two, it's all about family units and what different families may look like. Some families may have two mummies, two daddies, 
Um, so it's all about caring relationships further down in the primary setting. Um, as we move on to upper key stage two, we begin to look at and explore relationships and sex education. And here is where pupils are taught about what trans means and the different groups of people associated with this prefix. They are also taught about gender identity. The objectives covered are to know about gender identities and to have an awareness of transgender issues and to understand the difference between being a transgender person and a cross dresser. They are also taught about sexual orientation in a simple, factual way. Celibacy is also mentioned. So we're going to go through some lessons and how they progress throughout the year. So we're going to start with year three. So this is a year three lesson and our lessons are always supported by books. So there's Antangra Mix 3. We've also got Mummy, Mama and Me. And these are all to do with family setups. So we look at different family units in year three, and this kind of introduces the theme of LGBT through the family setup. However, we don't start using the acronym LGBT until year four. So in year four, through our topics of different communities, gender stereotypes, working together and relationships, the children will be introduced to key vocabulary, such as the acronym LGBT. LGBTQ plus is the statutory part of the curriculum. When talking about communities, the LGBTQ plus community will be mentioned. The children will be informed about respecting all communities and other people's choices. And then we start, uh, we start moving into chapter books. Is he a girl? Um, Bill's new frock. Okay, so moving into year six, and in year six is where the children are first taught sex education, um, which consists of one lesson that discusses conception from a scientific point of view. Um, we're going to show you an example just here on the screen of what this year six lesson would look like, and the objectives are knowing about gender identities and having an awareness of transgender issues, understand the difference between being transgender and transvestite, and one of the main activities throughout this unit will be that pupils are to discuss the meaning of gender and is it related to your mind, your body or both? So you can see as the children grow or sort of grow with sort of maturity and um, life experience, um, we tend to move into more sort of heavier discussions, um, discussion topics that children would pose questions or their own questions at the start of a unit for. And the next activity is an example of how we'd um, collate some of those questions. And the question that we'd like to pose to you is what questions would the pupils like to ask a transgender person? And what we do in the classroom setting is take all of those questions and throughout the unit or through each session, of course, having filtered through some questions, um, we would then use these um, to inform future learning or future planning for the children so that they feel like they've taken an ownership of their own education um, within a safe environment. And I think it's really important that the children know that it is a safe environment. Um, and that they are free to ask us questions um, as well. So this is an example of a mind map where the children would pose some of the questions that they'd like to ask um, a transgender person. And then what we would do is um, collate all of those together and answer those throughout each session. OK, and that brings us to the end of our whistle stop tour of what RSE looks like in our primary school. Um, I hope you have found that helpful. We come back to you. Thank, thank you ever so much for presenting there. Uh, very useful. Over to you, Joanne. All right. So, uh, yeah, we, if there's any um, comments that are uh posed for Kerry and Amanda I will wait a few minutes um just while we're waiting for any comments to come in uh those who ask questions to Andrew um he will be having a look at those in a short while to hopefully answer your questions for you but yeah if there's any questions now for Kerry and Amanda please do post them in for us Trying to avoid some more awkward silence. Um, so 
while I'm just waiting. Um, Carrie and Amanda, have um, like Andrew, have you have you had experienced any um, any parents questioning what you what you're doing with your your curriculum at all, and what sort of conversations have you had? Um, brief answer because we have got a question in for you actually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we have had some questions come in through when we've been releasing our policy. And um, what we've done is in, had a conversation with that parent. We've allowed them to come into school, have a look at resources when it's safe to do so. We have communicated everything to the parents and hopefully they then see what's going on and actually what we're teaching them. When... COVID has gone away and they're allowed to come into school. We do have an open door policy where they can come in, have a look at all the resources and then make up their mind when they've seen it all in front of them. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've got a question here from Chloe and she says, uh, what does your RSE education look like in Key Stage 1? So, um, should I start off? Yeah. Um, in Key Stage 1, it's more to do with consent. And we start off with sort of examples such as in assembly, you may have a child behind you who's sort of stroking your hair. Um, we start off with, you know, is that appropriate? Do you want someone to be touching your hair? Um, and it's sort of the idea of stop. No, I don't like it. This is my body. I don't want you to carry on. So we start to filter it through conversations of you making those decisions about yourself and your personal space. Um, so we start that off with with the idea of consent and you liking something or not liking it, um, being able to um, articulate that from a younger age. Um, it links in with all to do sort of with, with safeguarding of children, mm -hmm. making sure that they know um, scientific names as well for certain body parts. Um, and knowing how to express the way that they feel as a sort of way to then lead into consent later on as adults and leading into those sort of loving relationship scenarios that we talk about further up in key stage two. Mm. But as um, sort of lower key stage one and key stage one and even down to reception, it's all about sort of your best friend. And if you don't want to play that game, you just say no. Um, and it's equipping the children with the language to express the way that they feel. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so if anyone does have any further questions, then um, I would like to invite Kerry and Amanda if you're able to stay afterwards and then if any questions come up, then um, that would be lovely if you could answer them. Otherwise, uh, back to Alex. Sure, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so our next presenter, Daniel Tomlinson Gray, um, he's the co-founder and the director of LGB TED. Um, he's um, a writer of a um, uh, number of books, uh, one of which he's just edited, The Big Gay Adventures in Education, uh, from which he's going to share some of the LGBT plus uh, staff voices. So thank you very much for joining us, Daniel, and look forward to hearing from you. Hello. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. Mine's more of a mood piece, you could say. Um, just firstly, thanks for inviting me here. Um, as Alex said, co-founder and director of LGBT Ed, also a full-time teacher um, and the editor of the book, Big Gay Adventures in Education. I thought I'd mention that as soon as I possibly could. Um, this book is an important book reflecting the issues that really matter in schools today. And I've been asked to, to, to come and talk to you today about the issues that matter in schools today. Uh, for me, now more than ever, we need visible LGBT plus role models in our schools. We need open and proud LGBT plus staff voices. Currently, the UK's LGBT plus community is caught, you could say, in a culture war with huge government cuts to funding for school-based diversity projects and different minorities pitted against each other by the British mainstream media. But as the book shows, and as the teachers that we know in our network show, uh, there is still hope in our schools, definitely. Um, the Minister for Women and so-called equalities, Liz Truss, has suggested in the press that we should focus less on fashionable race, sexuality and gender issues and instead focus on poverty. This is part of a worrying trend reflected in the press where genuine issues and fears of minority groups are dismissed as part of a culture war. Perhaps through a uh, misguided fear that more equality for us means less for them, like Pi, uh, our ruling party is scrambling to protect a straight, white status quo. The fact that genuine movements like Black Lives Matter and issues around trans rights are dismissed as fashionable 
show just how out of touch our government currently is. Um, it didn't always have to be this way. In July 2018, former Prime Minister Theresa May's Conservative government launched its LGBT action plan, where it was claimed it was committed to making the UK a country that works for everyone. The administration wanted to strip away the barriers that hold people back so that everyone can go as far as their hard work and talent can take them. I was there at the launch of the action plan in the Garden of 10 Downing Street. And for a moment during Theresa May's speech, I saw glimpses of a policy that showed that LGBT plus people matter. But fast forward to nearly three years later, and that commitment has all but disappeared. Language directed at trans people in the press has frightening echoes of that used against gay people during the AIDS crisis. Known anti-trans groups like the LGB Alliance are now uncritically offered a platform by the BBC and are also now, as of last week, officially a registered charity. Uh, furthermore, the government's LGBT plus advisory panel was quietly disbanded last month. Um, gay conversion therapy is still legal. And we have a prime minister who once referred to gay men as tank top bum boys. Uh, funding for LGBT plus bullying projects also has been axed and funding for equality and diversity projects in schools has been cut on a massive scale. Whilst battling COVID-19, schools are now also battling culture wars. You could say it's, it's like a war on two fronts for teachers who are exhausted and at the end of their tether. To counter this worrying trend, it's time for more LGBT plus teachers like us to be visible in schools and show that there is hope for our young LGBT plus people. And that's why I'm here today, because I believe the main issue facing LGBT plus children in schools is the lack of LGBT plus role models. Uh, I co-founded LGBT Ed, a national network of more than 5,000, or more than 6,000 actually, LGBT plus teachers and leaders with business psychologist Hannah Jepson in 2018, because I, I believe that being visible authentic role models in schools is important. I grew up during the time of Section 28, um, and I was told by my school that they couldn't help me when I was bullied for being gay. They weren't allowed to promote homosexuality in any way, which is ridiculous when you think about it. It's like suggesting that we can be turned gay simply by being exposed to gay people, like being persuaded to like avocado for the first time. This is obviously nonsense, uh, my parents were straight, my teachers were straight, my friends were straight, there were straight people all over my television. But in the immortal words of Freddie Mercury, I'm still gay as a daffodil, my dear. Later, when I was myself training to be a teacher, I was told never to come out to my students under any circumstances because it would give them more ammunition. What kind of advice is this? This does our young people a deep disservice and they deserve better. In fact, wherever I have worked, as a teacher and as a school leader, the young people have been the most open-minded, accepting and welcoming of all. Only where they've been taught to hate by those they look to for guidance is this not the case. But our curriculum is still mostly, apart from the fantastic examples here tonight, which, which really bring me so much joy, our curriculum is still mostly teaching dead, straight, white men. And very little progress has been made. This is why LGBT Ed have launched with the National College of Education, our education management program, specifically for LGBT plus middle leaders and allies who want to progress in their career as an authentic LGBT plus person. It's fully funded by the apprenticeship levy and there are still some days to apply if you want to actually. What I'll do is I'll see if we can get the link put into the chat if you know someone who might be interested. Um, it's also pinned to the top of our Twitter feed. Our Twitter handle is at LGBTEdUK, um, or you can email inquiries at LGBTEd.UK. Uh, be sure to select Partners LGBT Ed when asked how you heard about us so we can then target you correctly as part of the LGBT cohort. Um, in this book, published, I've mentioned it again, uh, published through Routledge, the contributors are all out teachers or students of out teachers writing about how much it benefits our LGBT young people when they know someone around them who is LGBT plus and is okay with it. Because as the saying goes, you can't be what you can't see. How can you be expected as a young LGBT plus person to grow up to be successful, to feel valued and to feel respected if you never see yourself represented? We relied 
on the equality and diversity funding from the government to run two successful cohorts of our proud leadership program. We were determined to increase the number of visible school leaders and 75% of our participants achieved a promotion as a result of the empowerment that the program offered them. This therefore increased the number of visible and authentic LGBT plus leaders in schools for the benefit of children who need them most. However, this funding was pulled with no communication from the government and no warning. And with it no longer available, we risk losing the momentum behind us and undoing the work we've done. Some are arguing that during a time of national crisis, like the coronavirus, money might be better spent elsewhere, such as alleviating the poverty it causes. However, this does not take into account the fact that for so many, discrimination is the main cause of poverty. Individual subjective experiences, like those in the book and like those we're hearing tonight, really matter when there is no when there's so little data available that's why voices need to be heard amongst the staff we shouldn't have to choose which of the most vulnerable sections of society are worth fighting for finally just to finish um according to the stonewall school report in 2017 53 percent of lgbt plus students said there wasn't an adult at their school they feel they feel they could talk to while 45 percent of young trans people have attempted to take their own life. And half of those have succeeded. These horrifying figures show that now is not the time for diversity funding or for any discussions about diversity to be ditched. We cannot continue to claim that some identities are more or less valid than others. Suggesting that fighting for equality diversity isn't somehow fashionable sounds like this is exactly the way things are heading. Therefore, we have to fight back in our schools. Let's make sure that LGBT plus staff voices are heard. According to the Treasury's own figures, approximately 6% of the population are gay, which includes our young people too. So let's be the role models they need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I'll hand over to Joanne for questions. Thanks very much, Daniel, for those um, uh, poignant uh, statistics. Um, we are, let's see whether we have any questions coming through. Um, at the moment, I am uh, waiting for some questions. If anyone has anything that they would like to pose, any comments or questions, please do post them into the chat and uh, we will have some time I'm putting the link to the Middle Leaders program in our private chat. I'm not sure how to post it anywhere else, but if someone could please put that um, in the chat for everyone to see, that would be really helpful. And also our Twitter handle is on there as well. So I can ask, answer any questions. And also I'll put in my email address. So take as long as you need to get in touch with me and I will um, get back to you. There we go. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, yeah, so one of our admins in the background can uh, post them into the chat for everybody to see. That would be excellent. Um, we've got a comment from Jack who says, can you just uh, remind us of the name of your book, as I would be highly interested in purchasing. You mean I didn't mention it enough? <laughs> Here we go. It is called Big Gay Adventures in Education. Um, it's quite a memorable title that I'm quite impressed I got away with. Um, it was in the Amazon um, bestsellers for about seven minutes <laughs> a few weeks ago. So let's get it back up there. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Great. Um, at the moment, we don't have any other questions, but if there uh, do, if some come up, then um, we can direct you into the YouTube chat to ask while we are into the next speaker. So let's go back to Alex. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's great, thank you. And just to add, um, Daniel's book is available to all University of Bedfordshire students. I made sure that it was available in the library because I enjoyed reading it. So um, it's available as an ebook there. So um, it will be available to you. So um, our next speaker is uh, Sean Delenti. Um, he's going to be talking to us about empowering authentic schools. Um, he's a multi award winning teacher. He's an inclusion speaker. He's an advocate. He's a writer 
named one of the most, one of 100 most uh, influential LGBT plus people in the UK. And he's been honoured at the National Diversity Awards and re recently awarded the Freedom of the City of London. Uh, Sean, it's fantastic to have you. Thank you for giving up your time. Thank you, Alex. It's fantastic to be here. And uh, thank you to all of the speakers so far. It's been really inspiring. OK, I'm wary of the time, so I'm going to go straight on to the sharing of the slides, if I may. OK, hopefully you can all see these. OK, so thank you very much for that introduction. And as you've heard, uh, I'm an educator. I've been in education for 25 years, worked as a primary school leader, a teacher, a school governor, an, an improving schools consultant. And I also wrote the book Celebrating Difference, a whole school approach to LGBT plus inclusion. So today, um, as well as seconding everything that Daniel has just said so powerfully, I'm talking about empowering authentic schools. So to start with a question to you all, Take your minds back to when you were at nursery or primary school yourself. Can you reflect where, when and how did you learn about heterosexual, so non-LGBT plus people? So where, when and how did you learn about heterosexual people in primary school? And that's a question I ask when I'm out training teachers and speaking in universities. And the answer I get is always the same. Well, we learned about it everywhere, but it wasn't labeled as heterosexual. We learned about it through books, through models and images, through lessons, through role models. It was in every aspect of school life and school culture, but it wasn't labeled as heterosexual. And now, of course, we would label that as heteronormativity. But if we are striving for equality, which is what I hope we're doing, if we learn about heterosexual lives, histories and experiences in every aspect of school life and culture, then surely we should be learning about LGBT plus identities in every aspect of school culture as well. So authentic schools, what do I mean by this? These are kind of my definitions, really. Yours may differ or you might want to reflect on this after this presentation. Um, and if you want to contact me uh, for a copy of these slides, please feel free to do so afterwards. So it's a school in which all stakeholders feel safe and included, represented, validated and yes, celebrated for being their whole selves. It's a school in which children can explore themselves as unique individuals without fear or reprisal or a pressure to label themselves or indeed to compromise any aspect of themselves as a result of bullying or stigma or prejudice. It's about respectful relationships and grounding the school culture in that, that compassionate inclusion for all, for all, not just some stakeholders, not just the stakeholders that might align to our own personal, political or theological point of view. It's a school that in explores heritage, cultural, social and familial diversity whilst valuing and yes, celebrating individual identities and the personal skills and attributes that everybody brings. It's a school culture rooted in truth that doesn't model to stakeholders that they should lie or have to conceal aspects of themselves. And it's a school that uses a diverse range of role models, images and stories whilst acknowledging and exploring our shared potential for bias and prejudice, yes, bullying and hate, while supporting the development of strategies to disempower them. It's around teaching without shame about LGBT plus identities. If we teach with shame, then we will infuse shameful feelings upon those who identify as LGBT plus. But it's also about teaching and learning about the intersections between LGBT plus identities and other protected characteristics. It's about listening with compassion and valuing lived experience. And yes, it should be led from the top, but with buy-in across the whole school in terms of stakeholders at every level. And everybody within a school community should be able to robustly defend the moral and statutory case for LGBT plus inclusion and inclusion more broadly and widely. It's about being courageous and aspiration for all, not just some stakeholders whilst communicating the benefits of diverse representation and equitable inclusion. So we're talking about primary schools specifically today. Why do this, i.e. LGBT plus inclusion and inclusion more broadly in primary schools? Well, this is my 25th year in education. 
And throughout that 25 years, I have encountered some children identifying as LGBT plus in primary schools. That's a fact. I've encountered some children arriving into nursery and reception with same sex or transgender parents. That's a fact. I've encountered some children arriving at school already aware they have LGBT plus siblings and or family friends. That's a fact. I've worked with some staff who identify as LGBT plus. I've worked with some staff who have LGBT plus siblings and or family friends. Children will encounter LGBT plus people in society, in media and in workplaces, but also in their family, within learning communities and in secondary schools. So we want them to be secondary ready. Now, we do currently live in a country that has an Equality Act, and within that there are nine protected characteristics, as you probably know, gender reassignment is one of them and sexual orientation is another. And it's important to reflect on why we have these. These exist because of prejudice and discrimination, stigma, bullying, hate. If those things didn't exist, if they weren't directed towards these individuals and groups of individuals, we wouldn't need this Equality Act. And really, I come at this approach, this work from two points of view. One is a manager of people and one is an educator of young people. Because I know from my own lived experience, but also from research, that exclusion, prejudice, bias, stigma, bullying, a lack of authenticity, well, as a manager of people, that negatively impacts upon my colleagues, upon my staff team, upon their mental and physical well-being, upon their performance, attendance and business outcomes. And ultimately, that impacts upon teaching in a negative way. As an educator of young people, all of those horrible things negatively impact upon my young people's attendance, safety, mental health, well-being and academic outcomes. And I have lived experience of that. In 2009, in my own London primary school, pupil questionnaires revealed to us via pupil voice that 75 percent of our primary age pupils were being subjected to daily homophobic bullying and language in the school, whether or not they identified as LGBT plus. But none of our 150 staff had had any training, including me, on how best to represent LGBT plus stakeholders and therefore reduce uh, stigma, bullying and prejudice. I, to cut a long story short, wrote a training programme and started to deliver it in schools across the UK and I've now delivered it to many educators and initial teacher training faculties. And one of the activities that I do when I'm leading that training is I ask teaching colleagues in faith schools and non-faith schools in primary and secondary to um, brainstorm from their own lived experience what negative impact prejudice and bullying and LGBT plus bullying, um, what, what impact that has on the young people that they've met over the years. And sadly, um, when I collated those, uh, the, the, that lived experience, it created a list that's really a very sad and unhappy and concerning list. So if anybody ever says to you, why do we do LGBT plus inclusion in schools and particularly in primary? Well, it's to stop this sort of thing happening because this is not going to happen on our watch, I hope. It's not what we want for our young people. When I wrote my book, Celebrating Difference, I did a survey of my friends and colleagues who were not heterosexual. 170 asked, answered and I asked them at what age did they first know they were not heterosexual. As you can see, um, between six to 10 years and 11 to 15 years came out tops. So this is absolutely an issue for primary schools. And I should add, I knew I was gay in primary school myself. Now, we know um, from Andrew's experiences and other experiences that challenges can arise. I have to say that throughout the 11 years I've been doing this work, the LGBT plus work specifically, I haven't encountered a, a lot of challenge. And when it has arisen, I've been able to work with it positively to take it down. So I do think that we shouldn't focus wholly on the challenges and the barriers that can arise. But I do think that all of us need to be able to almost... Um, be able to speak in, in almost a PR way about what LGBT plus inclusion in schools and particularly primary isn't and is. It isn't promotion. It's about education and information. It's not about choices or lifestyles. It's about human identities. It's not an attempt to make children somehow LGBT plus. I don't know how you do that anyway. It's not about forcing gender identity or sexuality on anybody. It's about kindness, compassion not political correctness or wokeness, and it's not about culture wars. What it is about is education and information about LGBT plus lives, histories, experiences, and societal contributions. Human rights, health and well-being, 
recognizing that LGBT plus people exist and form part of our learning communities and societies. It's about dignity, respect, basic human rights, and yes, an intersection between faith, non-faith and LGBT plus. And that, and that word celebrating that Andrew was talking about, as school leaders and teachers, I believe it's our core duty to celebrate the authentic and joyful uniqueness of every individual in our school and communities. But that's not the same as asking parents or children to advocate for the LGBT plus community or attend a pride parade. And I think it's important we make that clear. I think we can just make a distinction between celebration with a capital C and a small c. And, you know, I've taught in secular schools where we teach world religions without expecting children to start practicing them. And the same is possible for LGBT+. As teachers and school leaders, we should meet everybody and celebrate them for whoever they are. In terms of support and challenge, there are those who strategically and actively challenge or protest against LGBT plus inclusion in schools. If you encounter that, reach out for trade union support. But there are also those who just need more information to help take them on the journey. And that's where your staff and parent information awareness sessions are important. There are also those who already support LGBT plus inclusion in schools. How can you bring them in further and utilize them? And of course, there are those who have lived experience and they might, I stress the might, want to share their own experiences and stories. So really, for me, this has been a very positive journey and a very joyful journey. Um, and for me, it's about sharing the benefits of diversity and inclusion for everyone with everyone. Quick heads up on some resources. If you don't know about Letterbox Library, you should. They do some amazing books. And I've got an inclusion for all book pack for primary schools on there with some books about um, same sex relationships and diverse families. And as I mentioned earlier on, I wrote this book, Celebrating Difference, A Whole School Approach to LGBT Plus Inclusion, which is on Amazon and iTunes, etc. So that's just a very quick, I'm just mindful of the time, so I'm going at 10 to the dozen a bit. I apologize for that. That's just a very quick um, blow through. I have to say, in 11 years, I've seen some fantastic work in, in secular schools and in Church of England schools, and I've worked with Catholic schools as well. It's not about placing a hierarchy on human identities or relationships. For me, it's very simple. It's about meeting people as they are, and it's about being compassionate and kind. So feel free to find me on Twitter. I'm at Sean Delenti. Uh, if you Google my name, you'll find articles, websites, resources. Feel free to reach out. So thank you for listening. Thanks for having me here today. Be kind, be safe, be proud. And whoever you are, I hope you can be free to be your authentic selves and empower our brilliant young people to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. And um, just to mention, uh, as well as Daniel's book, I have made sure that Sean Delenti's book, uh, Celebrating Difference, as well as Andrew Moffat's book, are available in the University of Bedfordshire Library, so that the students will have access to those, because I enjoyed reading them so much as well. Um, I wondered if I could just ask a, a question, Sean. Um, I wondered if you had um, you know, a particular profound moment where that you particularly enjoyed uh, where either a pupil or a parent um, really perhaps change their perception or, or were moved by some of the work that you've, you've done? Yeah, I, 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 when I came out at school, I came out to my whole school community in 2009. And that was really as a result of the data that we'd got around homophobic bullying. And, and I just felt I needed to come out at that point to kind of provide an authentic role model, but make the impact of homophobic bullying um, real. And that night I went home and I got really worried and thought, what's going to happen when I get to school tomorrow? Is there going to be a pro protest or whatever? And when I got to school the next morning, there were a group of parents, a group of Muslim parents actually outside my office. And they asked to talk to me and they came in and said, we just want to say thank you to you for what you're doing because we know you're not just talking about being gay we know that you're talking about diversity and inclusion more broadly and if you're making the school safe and authentic for you we know that you'll also be doing that for ourselves and for people of other faiths and people of no faiths and in fact for everybody and that really set the tone um, and just a few months ago actually I heard again from a student that was in the assembly when I came out and um, I can't actually read the message out without crying, so I won't do it now. But basically they said that you coming out in assembly saved my life, but it also established my career path. And they're working very high up now in Europe in diversity and inclusion. So thanks to them.
And, and a great impact from you, Sean. And, and thank you for um, all your experience and expertise tonight. Very, thank very you. grateful. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share it. Um, I'm aware of time, so I, I appreciate some people might need to leave us now. Um, but we've we've got one last speaker, uh, by no means least, um, our, our very own David Williams, who's the chair of the LGBTQ Alliance Group staff group here at the University of Bedfordshire. And he's very kindly offered to talk about his experience of setting up the group and, and running the group as well. So thank you, David. Thanks, Alex. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, what a great evening it's been. Uh, it's been so inspiring to me and so thought provoking everything that's been said. So thanks to Alex for setting this up and the University of Bedfordshire for, for helping make this happen. Uh, there's been so many energy, so much energy and so many ideas this evening. Uh, and and it's, it's such an important area of work that's going to affect all of our futures. Um, I think so many good practices that we can learn from. Um, as chair of the university's staff LGBTQ network, I, I feel quite privileged and lucky to work with a, a team, a small but select team um, of amazing people that work really hard to make a difference and to try and generate visibility to support staff and students uh, within the university. And we really are making a difference. Uh, we're quite new. And the fact that um, we can get a bit one of these prestigious uh, beds talks as part of the network led by Alex is an amazing achievement in itself, bringing all of you people together. And I think that visibility that everybody's got today um, reminds us that we're not just doing this on our own. We're all working together and we're making a difference and it can give us energy to carry on and can try to do even more. Um, and I hope that's what all of our different networks will do. Ultimately, we want a university uh, where everybody can be their true self at work, re regardless of their race or their color, their gender, their sexual orientation or their disability, just that everybody can be their true selves, bring their true self to work and be confident in that. And I know I'm talking to like-minded people on here. So if any of you do want to work with us, then please do stay in touch, get in touch. If there's any ways that we can support you, then please do get in touch or stay in touch. And we'd also be interested in doing any joint events in the future or networking together. Uh, but remembering that together we are stronger and that we can bring all our colleagues from, from your organization and our organization together. We can discuss these issues, we can look forward, and we can make actions that do make a difference and help bring everybody together. So thank you once again for everyone for attending and, and to the organizers. Alex. Thank you very much, David. And yeah, just to reiterate my own experience um, of setting up this evening, um, I, I've reached out to people and they've been so positive and supportive in coming back. So you, you're right, um, just reach out and you, you'll be amazed at, at how many people want to support. Um, just um, on that, um, I have some um, free lanyards that I would like to send out. Um, we've got we've got hundreds that we've uh, ordered here at the University of Bedfordshire. So I've shared, um, the LGBTQ Alliance email address. Um, so either if you'd like to um, get in contact um, uh, and uh, talk about any of the issues that have been raised tonight, or you'd like um, a land your large of your own uh, to support LGBT visibility within your own school, uh, please just drop us an email. Um, so that just leaves me to thank everyone this evening, all our speakers, um, uh, my co-host, Dr. Joanne Hill, um, and everyone in the background as well. There's been a lot of admin and marketing uh, and support to, to get this up and running this evening. So thank you to everyone that's been involved. Um, and I believe it will be recorded so um, you can watch it back as well. Thank you for listening and have a good evening. <laughs>